So, ladies and gentlemen, let's start with the presidential lecture as every year. And um, as we have just 45 minutes, we have to hurry. Uh, that's not enough to explain what all happened last year and is going to happen next year. And um, at least it's not enough to save the world in this short time. But we have to find out uh, what is true in this age of fake news. And I hope uh, Monsieur Trichet will help us uh, with clear insight what is reality and what is just perception of reality. So let's start 10 years after Lehman. Um, that uh, was very much uh, covered by the media. And uh, the message by the media was very simple. The banks, despite all the regulations, have not learned. They uh, started again where they stopped 10 years ago, and the risks are there. So the next financial crash is inevitable. Uh, it's just a matter of time. True or not true? <laughs> well, even in the age of fake news, uh, some of the responses have to be a little more nuanced, if I may, than yes and no. I would say yes, the dangers are still there. Yes, we have a probability, highly unfortunately, to have to cope with new big crises. I consider it's even likely for uh, reasons I could explain. But no, as regards the particular position of the banks, because it seems to me that precisely it is in the domain of banks that potentials have been reinforced uh, at the global level. Of course, one could always say that it is not sufficient in certain domain, but in my opinion, uh, hard work has been done and uh, for good. It's absolutely clear in my uh, understanding that uh, the banks are much less vulnerable at a global level uh, than they were when we had to cope with the worst financial crisis mm -hmm. since World War II, and perhaps could have been the worst financial crisis since World War I had we not been swift and uh, bold, I have mm. to say, in reacting. I'm speaking of the, of the central banks, of course, but also of the governments mm -hmm. in these dramatic circumstances. So you see, yes, yeah. there is a case for great vigilance yeah. and uh, preparing to be resilient when the uh, new challenges are coming. No, uh, I would not scapegoating the banks, yeah. even if well, we could discuss more on that. Yeah, look, look in, at the, the US. Uh, the government there uh, is reducing regulations, as I understand it, and leverage loans are just normal again. So is what happens now in the US worrying? Well, uh, the, the tendency of the US to consider that there has been over-regulation, precisely, of the financial markets in general and of the banks in particular, seems to me wrong. Mm -hmm. I take it that uh, we were paid to know uh, the price that all our societies uh, would have to, to pay for uh, absence of sufficient prudentials, absence of sufficient regulation. So I know, of course, that the banks were protesting more or less vehemently, depending on the country, on the, uh, I would say, uh, uh, force of the uh, new regulation and new prudentials. I think that uh, it is the proof that something has been done, uh, but uh, it was uh, poorly placed, in my opinion. And uh, I am very worrying on this you know, wave of deregulation uh, when we know precisely that the previous wave of deregulation before the crisis was one of the causes of the crisis, one of the dimensions of the crisis. Mm. Europe had another problem, the debt crisis, uh, on top of it. And now um, we have also, similar to deregulation, we have a government in Italy uh, who decided uh, we just don't keep the rules anymore. We uh, increase our deficit uh, to unknown levels as before and uh, let Europe uh, say whatever they want to say. We just don't obey anymore. So the question is now, if Italy fails, uh, the euro will be any more sustainable. True or not true? Uh, <laughs> first of all, we, we know that we uh, have a fantastic resilience 
uh, as regards the euro itself as a currency and as regards the euro area. After all, we went through the worst financial crisis, uh, as I said, since World War II or World War I, without having the euro as a currency put into question, and the euro has kept during all that period its own, its own credibility, it, the confidence of uh, market participants, and as regards the uh, euro area, remember, at the time of Lehman Brothers collapse, we had 15 countries in the euro area. The 15 are still there when a lot of my friends uh, abroad, particularly I have to say in the US or uh, elsewhere in the world, would tell me, you will not make it. It will necessarily explode. It will be dismantled. The 15 are still there, including Greece, as you know. And four new countries got in, so that we are 19 today. And they got in after Lehman Brothers. And of course, during all the time of the crisis. So I think that this is a stress test we should have in mind. The stress test was that we were resilient. Now, of course, we have a lot of new challenges that will come. When you are bold enough to do something that has never been done in the history of uh, mankind, namely you know, 19 countries today deciding in time of peace to embark on a union which is very, very important and comprehends a single currency, then, of course, you have challenges. I'm not surprised that we will have challenges. The US, when they created their single market with a single currency, had a lot of challenges. And it took a long period of time, of course. We are working ourselves in something which is a very impressive, bold, historic endeavor. And it started a long time ago. And it will go for, in my opinion, because it is resilient, because it corresponds also to the, what the, our people want. When I look at the Eurobarometer, I see a lot of support for uh, Europe, mm -hmm. European construction, the deepening of Europe, much more than what I read in the articles, I have to say. The Eurobarometer is, from that standpoint, extremely enlightening including in backing the euro as a currency for the single market. So you see, I am confident on the one hand, but I call for, of course, very, very hard work because it's normal to have regular challenges in such a situation. Now, the, back to Italy, yeah. if you wish. Yeah, Italy, Italy is bold, uh, maybe stupid. Uh, uh, just uh, ignoring the markets, uh, raising the interest rates and have to pay for more for that, and just uh, uh, refusing all the rules. This is a normal challenge we always have, or is it even more? Well, uh, first of all, in a single currency area, you need a governance of the single currency area that would be solid and strong. It was the lessons we drew from the crisis. Uh, you remember, mm -hmm. we created the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, mm -hmm. which is a new pillar for governance, which is extremely important, in my opinion, because it calls for monitoring the evolution of uh, competitiveness, national competitiveness inside the euro area, and it calls also for the monitoring of the external imbalances, balances and imbalances. Uh, we created, uh, through two treaties, the Fiscal Compact and the ESM. We ha embarked on banking union. Look at the structural reforms of first magnitude that we drew as you know, real-time lessons drawn from the crisis. And of course, we have to apply by the rule. That's my own understanding. Mm -hmm. Not applying by the rules before the crisis, was one of the causes of the crisis. There were many causes, and I had myself, my first speech in the European Parliament, immediately after having been appointed, was to say the Stability and Growth Pact is very important. It's a quid pro quo in the euro area for the fact that we have a single currency and we don't have a federal government and federal budget, so let's apply by the rules. At the time, you might remember vaguely 
that France, Germany, under the chairmanship of Italy, were more or less saying it's too tough on us. We don't want to apply exactly by the rules. It, it, it was something which was not very well inspired, frankly speaking, and I was against, and I said that publicly. But now we, of course, have to tell Italy that it is not in the interest of Italy, not in the interest of the people of Italy, of the citizens of Italy, to, I would say, weaken the quality of the signature of Italy. A lot of hard work has been done, a lot of hard work remains to be done to increase uh, the uh, productivity of Italy, growth in Italy, standard of living in Italy, and I think that this is extremely important. But to embark on weakening deliberately the quality of the signature will, as you said, put on Italy an additional burden yeah. in terms of market interest rates and will play against uh, what is looked after by any government, namely the best for their own people. So we will see what happens. But uh, I hope very much that this, which is obvious, will be more recognized uh, with the uh, time and uh, that we will have a maturing of the position which will permit to observe, mm. uh, I would say, a better, a better way of dealing with uh, the present situation in Italy. After all, again, I experienced myself all the problems we had in Ireland, Portugal, Greece, it, Spain and Italy also, when I myself, with my colleagues, with the SMP mm -hmm. decided to intervene on the secondary market. Yeah. So uh, Italy is a part of this populist movement all over Europe, and it's not only um, in uh, economic terms or financial terms, also in political terms. Uh, you are an ardent supporter of Europe. Do you see this populist movement? I mean, France now is more or less contained uh, by Macron, but uh, in the other countries, it's still on the rise. Is that something which worries you? Well, I think it's very worrying, and it's a most important political problem in practically all advanced economies, including in the advanced economy that manage themselves very well, and I'm speaking of Germany too. Mm -hmm. That being said, a mistake is very often made, in my opinion, in confusing the populist move that you have in all advanced economy, US, UK, continental Europe, and the, I would say, a move against Europe. What surprised me very much in the Eurobarometer was that you had the expression of frustration by our fellow citizens in all countries. This frustration was crystallizing in absence of confidence in national institutions, national governments, national parliaments first. And only after in the European institution and European, Europe as a concept. So if you look at it, you will see that uh, the main frustration is directed towards governments that were governing in the past and not against Europe. Uh, I know that it is not what you read in the papers, but please look at the Eurobarometer, at the figures. The figures are making a big difference between Europe and the national governments. I'm not surprised of that, because if we had not had the backing of our fellow citizens in all countries, we would not have been resilient in the past mm -hmm. when we had the stress test. And I would say, as regards the Euro, it's even more striking the uh, backing of the euro is at a very high level in all countries member of the euro area, particularly elevated in Germany, I have to say. You know, the, the sentence, uh, a single currency for the single market, the euro, is approved by 80% of the German. Mm -hmm. And again, a large majority for all countries uh, that are members of the euro area. So let's not confuse. We have a problem because our people are frustrated. And I can try to explain where I see the causes of this frustration. It is not directed mainly on Europe. And uh, 
uh, again, I understand that from the UK, for instance, yeah. you might make that confusion because of the referendum. But clearly, it is the case in the UK. It's not the case in continental Europe. So uh, this is just the question. Is it uh, the case really in the UK when you uh, apply sort of Eurobarometer? And uh, you know that there is a terminal. A terminal now, it's uh, going upside down. And nobody knows what's be the outcome. The best outcome would be a new referendum, true or not true? <laughs> For uh, that particular question, <laughs> I would uh, not be nuanced. I would like very much a new referendum, personally, as a number of uh, uh, political men and women in the UK, and perhaps a large part of the population of the United Kingdom. Uh, of course, I have nothing to to do uh, in, in the UK. I'm not a citizen of the UK, but I really take it that it was such a mistake to leave Europe, leave the, Euro the European Union for the United Kingdom, and they are progressively realizing to which extent it's a drama. It's also a drama, frankly speaking, when you look at the border between Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, and the United Kingdom. So, I mean, you, you have many, many reasons to say, well, after due meditation, frankly speaking, we have to reconsider the case. When I'm told that a referendum should never be changed, when I know that it was more or less invented in uh, the Bonapartist France, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not something which has coming spontaneously, apart from Switzerland, which is a very special case, but it's coming Uh, spontaneously from a representative democracy. In a representative democracy, majorities are changes, are changing from time to time. Why couldn't you reflect more and say, well, what we had decided earlier can be changed? It would be totally dramatic to have a way to crystallize for eternity decisions when representative democracy does not call for that. So, Again, response for me as a citizen of Europe would be yes, I hope that there will be a trajectory, a complicated trajectory in the UK democracy that will finally call for a new referendum. Let's look at France. Ah, you see, this was the right word. Um, <laughs> Look, let's look at France. Uh, Monsieur Macron, uh, uh, you were very much in favor of him, and he has very good uh, rhetoric so far. Um, had to, has difficulties now um, changing, reforming the country. Um, he was uh, celebrated like a messiah, and uh, the question is, Uh, he runs out of miracle, and uh, I don't know whether he ever had miracles uh, to perform. So is that true, that uh, Macron is coming down to earth now and getting more difficulties, not with his uh, European ideas, but inside France? Well, for, first of all, uh, he has been very, very important, in my opinion, in listing the many dimensions where Europe could proceed, and in my opinion, and he, he, his opinion made very, very, uh, I would say, eloquently, should uh, proceed. So that, that's for one. And of course, uh, as uh, Jean Monnet said, uh, you cannot realize things immediately. But what is important is to know that when time comes, you could do this, 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 and that. And what impressed me very much was that he did not only listed what we could do in EMU, mm -hmm. in, uh, our discussion is very much concentrated on EMU, but also on the other domain like defense, security, fight against terrorism, uh, border control, and, and, and. And all this is also very important, I trust. Second remark, uh, he embarked immediately on reform that were not popular at all. So when you utilize, rightly so, upfront your political capital to uh, do things that are not popular, you're, you're doing exactly the right thing. And that your political capital appears to be eroded is normal because precisely you did what you had to do to reform the country. Uh, he has a lot 
still to do to reform the country. It is what he says. I, I really take it that uh, my country needs a lot of reform and in many domains, and in economics, of course, uh, very much, because we have to get rid of the, uh, I would say, mass unemployment that we still have at a level which is inferior to what we had before, but which is still too high, particularly as regards youth, unemployed youth, unskilled youth. So mm -hmm. this has to be done. And uh, I take it that he has four years in front of him of uh, a solid majority in the parliament, and, uh, you know, the French institutions on that standpoint, when you have a solid majority in the parliament, are very solid. And, uh, and well, we, uh, he will continue to reform. Mm -hmm. No miracle would be expected, of course, because when, you, when Germany went out of its major difficulty at the very beginning of the euro, with mass unemployment and loss of competitiveness due to reunification, that was something you know, very, very, I experienced all that myself. Then it took a long period of time, year after year after year, to regain competitiveness, to regain the appropriate, uh, I would say, quality price for services and products, manufactured products, in order to eliminate progressively mass unemployment. And of course, structural reforms. I take it that uh, uh, it takes time. And there is no miracle, of course, mm -hmm. but a long-standing hard work, which is the way that is that we are France has started. With a little help from their friends uh, from Germany, for instance, when he, it comes to the European ideas of Macron, that could be quite uh, sensible. Do you think that uh, the German government uh, should push forward with support of the ideas, the European ideas of, from, of Macron? I mean, what, what we are calling the uh, European ideas of Macron because of the uh, Sorbonne speech, yeah. and as I said, the list of the dimension where we could and should proceed, was before the very uh, sentiment of, uh, of Germany. I, have, I, I remember the period of time when Germany wanted to proceed in the direction of political union uh, with the Chancellor Kohl, and the time where France was more hesitating, you know, to go resolutely in the direction of a political union. The idea in Germany was, okay for economic union and monetary union, but uh, we should balance that with political union. And some political union, of course, was uh, decided upon, but not all what Germany wanted at the time. So we will see, I see voices in Germany that are calling for proceeding uh, in the direction of, you know, establishing more, even more unity, a deeper uh, unity, uh, both, I would say, in the economic uh, side of the coin and also in the other side of the coin, including defense which where Germany has a decisive role to play, because if Germany decided to go resolutely in this direction, there it seems to me that it would change the picture in Europe, in continental Europe, very much, particularly at the time where the UK has left. So you see, uh, what remains true, in my opinion, even if it appears a little bit, you know, uh, concentrating on two countries alone, but when the engine of Germany and France is functioning, all our previous experience is that we can advance. And the, of course, if Germany and France are putting their friendship to the disposal of all other countries, and when I discuss with other countries that are neither Germany nor, nor my own, then I, they are telling me, that depends of what Germany and France will propose, of course, but if we have proposal coming from Germany and France, it's very important for us because, because we see the engine going, you know, again in uh, some kind of, uh, of a proceeding that, uh, that we can, again, we can accept or not, but, but we need it. We need the proposals mm -hmm. coming from Germany and France. So again, that friendship exists very profoundly and uh, it is something which is fundamental, which uh, kept, if I may, the Western part of Europe during a very long period of time in a peaceful uh, environment. And uh, I uh, am sure that we will continue to make this friendship to the service of Europe. Yeah. But now in Germany, we have a little problem. 
um, are we going to miss, uh, are you going to miss Mrs. Merkel one day? You would think that uh, she achieved a lot and she should carry on at least uh, until the end uh, of this legislative uh, period? Well, uh, of course, uh, I have to say that all French men and women were uh, uh, sad in uh, seeing that the, I would say, uh, statute of the Councillorine was a little less flamboyant than in the past because of the results of the recent election. Still, I have to say that compared with practically all other countries, the fact that the coalition which was in power before the election remain mm -hmm. a majority coalition after the election is unique. Of course, no, nobody in Germany stressed that uh, because of the uh, discovery that the uh, proportion were uh, lower uh, for both parties. But nevertheless, it was a confirmation that the, the German people was not that furious mm -hmm. in comparison with my own country, where the uh, government, the party that uh, had governed before, were, uh, you know, very, very hard, I would say terribly weakened. We are in a different situation. Uh, so I take it that, uh, of course, the councillorine played a decisive role. One of the uh, remarks I made on the fact that we were resilient in the worst crisis ever uh, is I put the credit for a large part to the councillorine because she, you know, could manage a situation which was extremely complex. I could see myself our public opinion in Germany was complex, was reflecting on what we, we were doing, should do, not, uh, not do. And it was uh, very, very complex. Uh, again, I was myself at the first, uh, you know, at, at the, the forefront of all that. So, but all taken into account after successive period where the rest of the world was saying, Germany will say no to helping this country, that country, uh, X, Y, Z countries. And there was a discussion in Germany, a discussion in the Bundestag, a very, very deep discussion. Of course, the global media were only picking up the no's and not the yes in the discussion, which is normal because, uh, you know, to say, well, finally, Germany uh, will vote yes is not spicy. Mm -hmm. What you must uh, communicate is that, uh, look at all those voices that are calling for a no. But uh, in the case of country X, country Y, and country Z, in all cases, the Bundestag voted yes, and very often with a, an overwhelming majority, which surprised very, very much the rest of the world, because they were not told that this would be the result. I mm -hmm. think it is the price to be paid in terms of global communication for a real representative democracy. Mm -hmm. The ultimate decisions after due enlightenment in, by the councillorine in particular, decisively, but the final say is the parliament. And that is a little bit unique, I have to say, at least in Europe. Uh, there, in my own country, when of course the president has a majority in the parliament, it goes without saying that what he has decided to do uh, is done. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there is no big debate uh, on whether or, or not France will say yes or no, you see. Uh, as I said, I think it is the complex communication, global communication, European also communication, of course, and national communication, which is associated with a full-fledged representative democracy where the ultimate decisions are taken by the parliament. Okay, let's look at somebody who has no problem with complexity because he has a very simple view of the world and he creates uh, uh, the fake news uh, and calls them truth, uh, Trump. Uh, in general, is a presidential system like in France, uh, do you think that the check and balances in the US so far have hold? So whatever he did so far is still much contained, or is this uh, development where everything is possible? No, I think, I think he had a big influence in certain domain, and in other domains, checks and balances have a function, obviously. 
uh, I think that he, there was no checks and balances when he decided to leave the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement. Mm -hmm. And that was, in my own opinion, catastrophic for the world and catastrophic for, for the United States of America, taking into account the fact that uh, uh, it was really uh, decisive to maintain uh, the presence of the United States in Asia. So it's not for me, of course, I'm not a US citizen, but I have a great difficulty to understand the rationale behind that. And there was no balances, checks and balances. Uh, when uh, I look at the uh, macroeconomic policies, uh, I see also a pro-cyclical policy, which is extremely, extremely impressive, and in my opinion, dangerous when time comes, uh, because uh, there will be the backlash, uh, and it is not exactly what you should do, probably at this stage of the uh, economic and business cycle. So again, second example of you know, decisions taken by the president, which were not, not uh, checked and, and balanced. And there are a number of others. In other uh, dimension, of course, you had the uh, uh, Republican, uh, both houses, uh, hesitating on this and that, and he could not do all what he wanted to do. And uh, for uh, many, many dimensions, perhaps it was uh, good. The justice uh, also, at the, not at the level of the Supreme Court, but at the level of many judges, was uh, resisting uh, a number of decisions taken as regards immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, so there you could see, under our eyes, the system of the US of checks and balances. Now you have, after the midterm, uh, of course, the House of Representatives, which is now in the hands of the other political party. So there is an inbuilt uh, check and balances uh, there, uh, which doesn't mean that the President of the United States will not continue to govern with uh, uh, looking for consensus between both chambers. We will see. But uh, again, we are in a different universe. It's, uh, France is not at all a presidential system like, like the Uni no, United the States of America. True. True. And I, I, there are only a very few countries in the world where you have this uh, pure presidential system. Uh, Mr. Trump uh, likes to lower interest rates, and he criticized uh, the Fed quite a lot. So is this uh, an attack on the independence of a central bank, uh, which you as a central banker must really suffer from? Well, for, first of all, uh, independence of the central bank is absolutely decisive. And I, I, I trust that all uh, the persons uh, that are uh, in this room know that if they have the sentiment that uh, the central bank is not independent, that the central bank would be depending on short-term consideration of a political nature, then you don't know whom to trust. You don't know whether you can trust the currency, you can trust uh, price stability and uh, financial stability by way of consequence. So everything can go plain wrong. Uh, it didn't go plain wrong in the United States, mm -hmm. even after the remarks made by the president. I guess that it was before nobody was making the working assumption that the Federal Reserve could be influenced by such rhetoric. And also because the uh, US public opinion and the global public opinion is used to excessive uh, rhetorics of the president of the US. So it seems to me that until now, taking into account the law, which will not be changed uh, in uh, the US, which protects the independence of the central bank, and taking into account uh, what everybody knows of the capacity of the president from time to time to be excessive without consequences, uh, I take it that uh, the, the Fed will continue to do exactly what's appropriate, taking into account, of course, uh, the situation, taking into account the evolution of uh, the economy, the cycle, and also, of course, mm -hmm. datas that are coming regularly. Would, would you judge then that uh, the Fed is again back on a sort of normal level of monetary policy now, which means when there is another crisis, they have some food to uh, act against? Well, they are not yet at a, a normal level. If you take, uh, for instance, the fact that many uh, economists, 
academics are uh, suggesting that to combat the recession, the decrease of interest rates in the US historically should be of the order of magnitude of five full percentage point. And they have not that room for maneuvering. They have not that kind of ammunition today. It's true that uh, the, the Fed uh, is in a situation where you have full employment, where you have uh, growth, which is quite substantial, higher than the growth potential of the United States, mm -hmm. obviously. And uh, of course, uh, they will probably continue to normalize the, the monetary accommodation, both, I would say, in uh, increasing interest rates and also in progressively uh, decreasing the level of uh, debt outstanding that they have in their portfolio. Mm -hmm. All this was done until now with uh, uh, very good information in advance of the market, of market participants, and I take it that they will continue to do so. Mm -hmm. Something for the ECB to learn from America? I, I mean, it seems to me that the ECB is in a cycle which is uh, lagging the US cycle, not surprisingly, yeah. because we had all the drama of the private financial crisis, if I may, subprime and Lehman. By the way, speaking of that episode of our own crisis, there was not a single Lehman brother collapse in Europe. I was, no, no, no I was experiencing that. Yeah. I can tell you that, of course, we were 15 countries, as I said, in the time of Lehman. Look at the difficulty that the US had to get the approval of the TARP agreement. There was refusal by the Congress because the political sphere was not on board for putting a trillion mm -hmm. dollars in order to combat the financial house of cards which was collapsing. Fancy that we were 15 in Europe. So in 15 countries, you had to get the political decision in Germany, in my own country, in the Netherlands, in Belgium. I had to go to the Council of Ministers of Belgium to explain why they could not let a bank collapse because it would create a drama for Belgium and a drama for uh, all of us, exactly as Lehman Brothers had proved to be totally catastrophic. I draw your attention to that. Nobody never stress that we resisted the first episode of the crisis when it was much more difficult in Europe than it was in the US uh, because there was only one decision-making process and we had 15. Now, we had the sovereign risk crisis, one third of the countries in the euro area were in a very difficult situation. The two or the third were not in a difficult situation, but it created a very, very important problem for something like 37% uh, of the GDP of the euro area, something like that. And of course, that created a lag in the business cycle. So it seems to me that the ECB is doing what was necessary with a lag in comparison with the US, and I was speaking of the, uh, I would say, a forward guidance that was given to the market to understand what was likely to happen. It seems to me that it's, it's been doing by the ECB, uh, not surprisingly, more or less like it was done in the US. For instance, at the moment I'm speaking, market participants know, it seems to me, uh, when we, uh, they will inter interrupt the uh, QE, when they will continue to maintain the portfolio at the same level for a long period of time, and when it is likely that perhaps they will touch interest rates. Uh, all this has been said, made public, and when I discuss to, with market participants, investors and, uh, and savers, they, they know all that. Mm -hmm. Of course, everything depends always, as far as decisions of central banks are concerned, on data events, and we might have new events that might come from everywhere. Growth in Europe is slowing down. So um, that could mean a new crisis, and normally um, central banks would uh, take some countermeasures. Can the ECB still do that, or have we just pray and hope that growth would not slow down too much? 
First of all, uh, growth is slowing down at a global level. As you remember, the IMF uh, reviewed down its, uh, uh, I would say, growth projections for uh, 18 and 19 by point, minus 0.2 percent. So it's, it's something which is substantial for the IMF to change uh, the, the projection of that order of magnitude. It's not because of the US, because the US, on the contrary, as we said, are pro-cyclical in the present period, which is good for the present moment, but not good, uh, not good in the, when time comes uh, later on. Uh, if the US would not contribute as it does presently to global growth in this year and probably next year, we would have a reviewing down even more of the, of the projections by the IMF. So it's true that we are uh, in circumstances which from that standpoint are not very good. And Germany knows that better than anybody because Germany being highly internationalized is hit mm -hmm. by uh, what's happening at a global level. My own understanding is that nevertheless, our cycle is such and we have still in many countries uh, I would say a, a lot of, uh, of unemployment, which is calling for, uh, for uh, continuing to grow in the cycle. So we will see exactly what happens. I am not too pessimistic, even if we are seeing you know, a slowing down on Europe for uh, this year and next year. I would, I would follow more or less the ECB staff projections, mm -hmm. which are in line with the IMF projection. We will see again, we have to remain, of course, cautious and prudent in this respect. Now, it's clear that if recession comes from the US, either our own dynamics is such that we avoid to be plunged in a recession by contagion, maybe at the end of next year, maybe in 20, we will see. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we are not in a difficult situation. If by contagion we have our own recession at a moment of the cycle which is not appropriate, then ammunitions will be lacking, at least in monetary policy. And in some countries, unfortunately, also in fiscal policies. Mm -hmm. In other countries, there would be some room for maneuvering. And uh, of course, I'm thinking of Germany because of the current account surplus of Germany, which is really very big. Mm -hmm. And because of the uh, overall, I would say, uh, room for maneuvering that exists in macro policies in Germany. As if I look at the single currency area as a whole, as you know, we are posting a current account surplus of 3.5% which suggests that there are implicit room for maneuvering, implicit ammunitions on the macro side, if you take the single currency as a whole. In comparison with the US, they have a current account deficit of minus 2.5%. You see the difference? It makes a difference of a full 6% of GDP, mm -hmm. all things being equal, between the US and Europe. So, we will see what happens. But I draw from this observation that we have a big, a large current account surplus, the conclusion that if there is an economic will and a political will, we will nevertheless have some ways that will not be monetary policy, but could be other ways to combat the recession in that, let's say, Bad, bad assumption where we are under the contagion of the US. So back to the future to 2019. We have heard about your expectations. What is your wish or your dream of 2019 to finish this talk? <laughs> this is an, <laughs> a marvelous question. I, my dream would be, of course, that the route, the way, the path to improve Europe, deepen the European uh, institutions, uh, the European uh, uh, construction would be taken firmly by Germany 
and my own country and the other countries that are uh, you know, eager to advance. There are areas where we have a big potential political support of our public opinion. Control of our borders is supported by practically all Europeans. When I look at the survey, national surveys and uh, the uh, survey all over Europe, uh, defense seems to be more and more popular. I know how difficult it is uh, in some countries, and of course, Germany is a case in point. But if you look at the people's sentiment, rightly so, with the attitude of the United States of withdrawal, more or less, with what happens in the east of Europe, you have, it seems to me, a backing. And a fight against terrorism also is backed by our people. And uh, I would say security. Uh, external and, uh, and internal security. So these are areas where if there is expression at the appropriate level of the executive branches and parliament of a real will, the backing of the people is potentially there. And I would be so happy. Now, as regards the, uh, the single currency area, as regards EMU, I myself is convinced that we have to apply by the rules, all the rules that we have, they are numerous, and many of them have been improved recently, mm -hmm. uh, including on the fiscal side and on the economic side, as I said, and on the competitiveness side of the coin. I take it that we have to achieve the banking union. It's a priority. I take it that we have to embark, even if it is not, you know, very, very big, but in some kind of budget, and I could see voices, including in the German government, that were making a plea for some advances in this area. I take it as something which is, which is important. And, uh, of course, I myself was, I think, the first to suggest that we should have a Minister of Finance of the EU area, which means, in my opinion, a person, man or woman, who would be the chair of the Eurogroup, not being simultaneously a Minister of Finance of a particular country, in order to concentrate on the management of this immense single currency, with a single market, I mean, with a single currency area, it, it is an immense, it's, it's as large as the United States of America. You need somebody to integrate all that with all the, the pillars for governance I was already mentioning. And I also take it that we could improve, when time comes, the uh, uh, democratic legitimacy of the very difficult decisions to take in uh, the euro area when we have something like Greece yesterday, maybe other difficulty when time comes, perhaps the last word should be given to the MPs that have been elected by the fellow citizens directly of the euro area. So I made those proposals some time ago. Uh, I'm not dreaming. I'm sure that we will continue to deepen, mm -hmm. as I said, our friendship and our European Union. Even if you are not dreaming, dreams sometimes become true and maybe your dream will come true uh, for next year. I think we all go out of this room a little bit more encouraged uh, than before. And uh, uh, if this is the result of our talk, then it is, uh, or there was a successful talk. Thank you very much indeed. And see you back next year for a new insight.